Welcome. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We're relieved to see that our uh, Zoom to YouTube connection is uh, is functional and speedy as uh, as we have grown accustomed to it being so that folks uh, can follow along with our uh, committee work. Uh, we are gathered again this afternoon to uh, do some more work on S25. And um, I think the first perspective that I'd like to hear is from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So we have uh, Nick Grimley with us. He's the Director of Entrepreneurship and uh, Tech Commercialization, and he is uh, going to help us understand what, um, what language we might need to add to the bill to, uh, to clarify ACCD's role with respect to um, business uh, supports for the new cannabis industry. So welcome, Nick, and um, would love to uh, have you fill us in on the work that you've been doing. Thank you. For the record, Nick Grimley, Director of Entrepreneurship and Tech Commercialization with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Governor, Government Operations Committee, uh, thank you for allowing ACCD time to testify on S25. Uh, which specifically calls on the agency to administer a social equity loan and grant program. Um, overall, we're uh, supportive of taking steps to support those who have historically been uh, disproportionately impacted by the cannabis prohibition. Uh, however, um, we want to suggest some language changes uh, that would help ACCD achieve the goals of this specific program and address the technical and staffing issues faced by the uh, agency. Um, others in the administration, such as uh, the chief prevention officer, uh, will uh, likely offer feedback on other uh, portions of the bill as it's drafted. Uh, to frame this, ACCD does not have the technical expertise to underwrite and service loans. Uh, typically, we would work with VITA to execute a program like this, um, but they can't make loans to cannabis-related businesses at this time. I believe that has to do with um, some federal programs um, from which they draw down uh, funds from Treasury. Um, we want to suggest the following language that would allow us to contract with an organization um, capable of providing the financial assistance uh, loans, grants, and outreach outlined in the bill, um, and we have submitted um, a suggested uh, revision for the committee's consideration. Um, would you like me to read that language, or would you like me to... Uh, um... We have the ability to call up the language from our committee page, and we usually do that on a secondary device, so I think if you want to just generally describe what it is you have brought to us. Um, okay. We Sure. Um, so we've uh, added language to uh, the, um, the current bill or suggested language um, to add um, that the agency may procure um, by contract all or part of the necessary underwriting um, execution and administrative services required um, for loans and grants um, to be made from the cannabis, develop, uh, cannabis business development fund to eligible social equity applicants as allowed under this chapter. Um, should the agency be unable to do so, the program shall not move forward until the legislature appropriates the operational resources necessary for ACCD to make loans and provide financial assistance to social equity applicants. Um, and I think I can uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, that's based on a couple of conversations I've had um, with um, the uh, um, Vermont State Employees Credit Union, which is really kind of on the leading edge of um, working with this industry. Um, and, um, and then in conversations with DFR, um, and I would actually recommend that you uh, may want to have both of those groups in um, to provide their insight on the uh, the banking considerations um, and uh, issues that face this industry um, in that respect. Um, VSCCU was in 
was generally, uh, you know, they, they thought that uh, this was a great idea and, and may in concept be able to, um, to help the agency um, out in a program like this, but um, it would certainly uh, have to better understand the details um, as the uh, Cannabis Control Board uh, defines that program. Um, we'd also like to suggest that the uh, Cannabis Control Board work in consultation with ACCD and the executive director for racial equity in determining the eligibility requirements uh, for this program. And I, I think that's, uh, I, that's pretty much what I have for today. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have at this time. Thank you for being here. Um, committee members, any questions? Must be crystal clear. All right. Um, I appreciate you um, submitting some uh, recommended language and um, we appreciate your uh, flagging this and, and helping us to work through some of the details um, about what we need in the bill to make this uh, system work. So thank you. Yeah, we'd like to see it be successful and we think this is a good path towards that. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. You're welcome to stick around and listen if you'd like. I think next we're going to hear from uh, Jordan Wellington, uh, who is a partner at VS Strategies with um, a recommendation on, um, uh, on an issue with respect to the cannabis system. So welcome, Jordan. Uh, thank you very much, Representative. Uh, really honored to be here today. My name is Jordan Wellington. I'm a partner in the firm VS Strategies. We are a public policy consulting firm specializing in cannabis regulation, having worked with regulators, uh, policymakers, industry members from really all over the world uh, ever since uh, being the point person and policy person that helped implement Colorado's legalization. Um, before I talk uh, about the amendment that I'm going to mention and, and discuss a little bit and hopefully answer some questions about, I just want to mention uh, how much of a privilege it is to be able to speak here today. I actually grew up in New Jersey on the East Coast, spent a tremendous amount of time in Vermont and have a ton of love for your state. My brother, Corey, actually attended the University of Vermont many moons ago. Unfortunately, we're older than uh, in our early 20s. And my youngest brother, David, actually just moved back from Colorado to Vermont and is actually living in Vermont now. And so uh, absolutely love your state and thrilled anytime I get a chance to help out and answer some questions about public policy. Um, today, I'm gonna be speaking to, uh, I believe what's a proposed amendment. Uh, this is really just a technical change from uh, the bill last year. Um, in Vermont's legalization bill, a uh, potency cap of 60% was imposed upon final cannabis products. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, unfortunately, some unintended consequences of that language is that uh, that cap is not only being applied to products that are being sold to consumers uh, to help protect public health and safety, but also to intermediary products that would be sold business to business only, not to a consumer. Um, and so basically what's going on here is that um, when a licensee needs to produce an infused product, whether that be a topical, an edible, a lotion of any kind, um, they are going to buy a cannabis extract from another manufacturer. Um, it, to comply with the law, that extract would actually have to be diluted down through additives that are not necessary to the production process down to meet the 60% threshold, then transferred to another business, refined and purified to either remove those additives or just stick them in the product as well. Um, and then a final product would be produced that would be subject to that threshold. And so really the idea here is that this wouldn't alter the 60% cap for products sold to consumers, but just allow businesses to operate a little bit more efficiently on a business to business transfer by exempting only those products, those intermediary business to business products from the cap, uh, while it, whereas retaining it for any products that would be sold to a consumer. Um, this kind of gets into the technical extraction and production process. I'd be happy to answer any questions about that, but figure um, now is the best time for me to just stop talking and answer questions from y'all as opposed to just continuing to ramble about technical production aspects in the cannabis industry. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sorry that we couldn't give you an excuse to, um, to jet to 
the Green Mountain State uh, in order to share your uh, testimony with us today, but this is a little more efficient, I suppose. Committee members, any questions um, about uh, the concepts that Mr. Wellington has just presented? Uh, Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Wellington. Um, what is the percent of tetrahydrone cannabin oil generally in the concept of what you're talking about? Is it usually 100%, 80%? Uh, Representative Committee Chair, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think that it depends on the, the type of extraction and refinement method. Um, and, and you know it really just depends on whether you're trying to make what's commonly referred to as a distillate. So you're removing all chemical constituents of the plant other than THC or whether you're trying to leave terpenes and other cannabinoids in there. On average, you're probably talking about between 70 and 90-ish 90, 90 percent. Um, and again, these are not products that will be sold to consumers. It's just about an efficiency measure between operations and not needing to say something. Okay, well, it's 30, it's 90 percent THC. We're actually going to put 30 percent of God knows what in there to get it down to 60, transfer it over to the topical manufacturer who's then going to have to figure out how to get it out of there so they can put it into a bomb or a lotion or an edible or I don't know any, I mean, the number of products kind of tend to, to, to move with time. So anything else? Very good. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? All right, well, you, you must have made your ask crystal clear and uh, we will um, certainly take a look at the uh, suggestion and uh, welcome you to stick around. We've got a few more witnesses with us this afternoon, um, but thank you for being here today. Excellent, thank you very much, appreciate it. Next up, we have Pietro Lin, who is uh, with the Vermont uh, CBD Labs of Williston. Um, welcome, Pietro, and, and uh, welcome you to uh, share, share your thoughts with the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Pietro Lin. I'm a lawyer I, in Burlington, and I represent Vermont CBD Labs. And the reason we're here is because we're, we're faced with a quandary. Um, Vermont CBD Labs has a proprietary technology that it's developed that will allow it to process um, hemp, uh, that is CBD oil, hemp products, into Delta 9 THC at about 80 or 90 percent purity. Uh, that, that is for Vermont, I think, an exciting prospect because it means that those of us who have worked for companies in the hemp industry and have seen our clients suffer terribly because of the, the decline in the hemp market or in the CBD market um, have suddenly hope. Farmers in Vermont who don't have a market for their hemp uh, hemp processors in Vermont who don't have a market for their isolate or distillate may very soon, if we're successful, have an ability to create a product that will be filling a void in the cannabis space. And so what, what, is, what is the process and then what is the problem? The process looks like this. Um, we're very comfortable with the concept that Vermont already has a statutory scheme that governs the growing and processing of hemp into CBD oil. And there's, a, there, there's re regulation that governs that and it's, we're very content with that. Um, we're also content with the concept that Vermont has a statutory scheme that's going to govern uh, cannabis and the processing of cannabis into THC. The, the rub, the area where there is a gap statutorily that cannot be filled by regulation is what happens when you have cannabis and you or I'm sorry, what happens when you have T, when you have a CBD oil and you want to turn it into THC? Because under the hemp regulations, you can't process your hemp product into something that has less than 0.3% THC. Under the cannabis statute, you cannot process something that is based on hemp, that is CBD oil. And we've got this gap where we want to use as an ingredient to turn it into Delta 9 THC, a processed hemp uh, isolate or distal. And we must have a change in the statute if we're going to be able to do that. And that's why we're here. 
And that's why uh, we've suggested some language that would modify the present statute that would allow people who um, purchase uh, CBD oil to process it as an ingredient with cannabis into Delta 9 THC. We're not looking to expand the reach or the scope of the, of the hemp statutes. Um, we're not seeking somehow to find a way to undermine the scope of the, the hemp statutes. What we'd like is something that specifically and statutorily contemplates taking CBD oil, using it as an ingredient in a process that chemically transforms the CBD oil into Delta 9 THC, something that is not presently doable under either set of statutes. And we're looking to you to create the bridge between the two of them. Uh, let's see, Representative Anthony has a question. How would this, thank you, by the way, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for coming to testify, um, Mr. Lin. How would this, if at all, disturb our um, uh, sort of charting a course for the cannabis market? And you, you can say it doesn't affect it at all, but if you think it does, I want to know now. No, I, I think it's an, it's an outstanding question. So let me, let, let me answer it this way. Um, if, if this committee is, in, is focused on creating a set of rules of the road when it comes to cannabis, there is nothing about what we're asking for that would change it in any way. All we're asking for is an ability for people who have obtained the correct licenses to include CBD oil in a chemical process that includes cannabis and transforms the CBD oil as part of that process into Delta 9 THC. And so if you're asking me, is there something about what, what would be done in this process that is fundamentally different than what is contemplated by the cannabis statute? The answer is no, it, it isn't. It's just by quirk, by the way that we have drafted these two sets of statutes, in, in the cannabis statute, we say, oh, you can't do anything that with, with what might be covered under the hemp statute. And in the hemp statute, we say, oh, you can't do anything that might be covered by the, the cannabis statute. And what we're, do, what we're asking for is something that specifically recognizes and contemplates a process that, that takes the, the Delta 9, I'm sorry, that takes the CBD oil and turns it into Delta 9 THC. And that can't happen, and it can't even be part of regulations under the current statutory scheme. The reason I say that is because the current statute for cannabis says you may not process anything that fits under the hemp statute. And, and if that is so, there is never a regulation that can fix that statutory exemption. I understand. I just, uh, uh, because uh, hemp folks and cannabis folks will be subject both to licensure uh, on, for better or for worse by different, if you will, uh, overseers. I just want to be sure I'm clear as to what that may introduce in terms of either complexity or policies that we hadn't, uh, or tendencies for market pressures that we had not contemplated. That's why oh, okay. I asked. Okay, no, it's a good question. So let me see if I can ask, answer it a little better than I did last time. Um, look, what, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a bigger market for hemp and for hemp farmers. And that market is going to be to create CBD oil that will then be used in this process. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're going to increase the number of farmers or increase the number of acres that can be used to grow hemp. Um, that, that is likely to happen. And if we ever reach a time in the United States where federally um, cannabis becomes legal, I, I think that the possibilities for a Vermont company that has proprietary technology that will be appealing nationwide is very exciting as an economic development project. And, and, and so representative, in terms of what happens in the cannabis space, you know, all we're saying is that is that somebody who is licensed to process cannabis can buy from a licensed hemp uh, processor the, the CBD oil, 
added into the the hemp or I'm sorry the cannabis process the cannabis product process it turning all of it into THC and that so in terms of license we're not asking you to do anything that's that's any different than what I think you conceptualize. Representative thank you. Pigley has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you, Mr. Lynn. Um, I think I mentioned this the other day in committee, but I'm a little confused. Um, there was a story on the news uh, regarding uh, Delta-8. Is there a difference between Delta-8 and Delta-9? Yeah. So, so look, I'm not an expert when it comes to, to Delta-8 or Delta-9, but this is what I understand to be the distinction. Delta-9 has psychogenic properties, meaning it, it affects your mind. Uh, Delta-8, which is technically legal, right? It's not against the law. Um, it, it has not been federally outlawed in any way, but it, it has a more you know, body-based consequence, right? It, it relaxes you in a way that, as I understand it, I've never used it, is quite significant, but it does not affect your mind. Okay, thank you. Representative Gannon. Thank you. Um, have any other states regulated this process? So the, the, the answer is that, um, for example, in Colorado, they have regulated the process. But but the, the reason, Representative Gannon, that I'm sort of here on hands and knees asking the committee to make statutory changes is because I don't think our statute allows it. Because the language in our statute specifically says that you, as a, if you are a cannabis licensee, you may not process hemp or hemp, um, hemp oils and extracts. And that's where we run into problems. So, I, I mean, there are states that have, have gone that route, but, but given the current statutory scheme, I don't know that we can because specifically hemp products are exempted from processing under the cannabis license. So, no, I, I understand that that's what Act 164 does. I, I was just trying to understand what, what if any other state what any other state may have done as to how they're regulating this process, just so I can educate myself. Yeah, no, that, it, it, it's a great question. So as I understand it, there, there have been regulatory changes in Colorado, uh, regu regulatory changes in Michigan um, that would reflect this process. I, I don't quite know the status in, in Illinois, but I understand there's been movement in that direction. Um, so it, it's not like you're the first ones to address this problem. It's just that we, you know, we have a statutory scheme in Vermont that requires legislative intervention. And can you explain the process a little more? And what I'm specifically interested in is, is you know, compared to, you know, taking cannabis and converting it into a THC concentrate. I mean, is there more energy used in converting CBD oil into a THC product? Um, because you know, you know, the bill does speak to energy requirements, water requirements, and things like that. So I'm just trying to figure out: is there a different environmental impact um, to the process you're describing versus you know converting cannabis flour to to some other cannabis product? So, so let me let me answer it as best I can. And, and the disclaimer up front is that I'm not a I'm not a technician. Um, that, so I, it's not my area of expertise, but it's been explained to me. And what I what I've heard is this: is that it does not require any more energy. It, the process um, just is is different. Um, and what what is I think if we're con if we're considering um, energy related issues, one of the things we know is that hemp can be grown outside. And that hemp can be grown more easily with more with less effort than cannabis. And so, in some ways, if we're looking to diminish the impact on the environment, this is one way to do it. Because, of course, if 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 the product is at least in part hemp, then we are using less resources to get from point A to point B. 
Okay. Um, and so I'm just trying to understand the intersection between, you know, Vermont's hemp regulation and its cannabis regulation. So if you have the, the CBD oil would be regulated by the Agency of Agriculture, right? That's right. And then at some point you're, you're taking it through a process um, that converts it to Delta 9 THC. And, and so I guess it's that conversion process where the cannabis regulatory realm would take over. The, the, the answer is exactly. yes. So, so, so the, you know, like the, the issue here is going to be, we don't want to undermine the hemp uh, regulatory scheme in any way. And, and the Department of Agriculture is understandably um, wants to make sure that whatever work I'm trying to have you do here, that, that it doesn't undermine what, what it seems to be a very successful and good program. And this doesn't, right? We, we, you have to operate under a hemp license to take the dried hemp and process it into isolate or distillate. And, and what we are contemplating then is that if there is somebody with a cannabis license who wants to create a cannabis-like product, that this is, it, and if part of that conversion process, this isn't sprinkling CBD oil into something and saying, drink it, it's good for you. This is fundamentally changing its chemical composition. And so what we're saying is for that transition, we, we think, first of all, we can't do it now, but if we're going to be able to do it, we think it ought to come under the cannabis license. Understood. So have you spoken with the Agency of Agriculture about this process at all? We have indeed. And, and they were comfortable with it so long as it did not in any way diminish the effectiveness of their program. And I, I, we understand and support that. And, and you know, we propose changes that leave them wholly undisturbed. Okay. And who did you speak with? Oh, forgive me. Um, I, I, you know, it's one of those things. I'm an old man, and I've forgotten the name, but it, but it was the person at the department. Kevin Ellis was with me, and, and I know this, that it was the person who was responsible in the first instance for the HEP program. Carrie Jaguer. That, that's the name. Thank you. Okay. Small state. All right. We, we know Carrie. <laughs> All right. Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you. I recognize that you might not actually know the answer to my question, but I'm hoping that if you don't, you can point me in the direction of who would. And that is, it's kind of a multi-parter, but the beginning part is what are the fundamental differences between this chemically created THC and naturally occurring THC? Okay, so that, that, that I do know the answer to. And the answer is it's indistinguishable. Okay, and so we're certain that there wouldn't be additional adverse effects. And the reason I ask is because we've kind of gone down the road before of sort of laboratory recreating something naturally occurring with sometimes catastrophic outcomes. So I want to make sure if we're going down that road, we really know what we're getting into. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, the, the process uh, creates a compound that is indistinct. You know, it is, it is TH, delta-9 THC. And there are no, you cannot distinguish it from natural products. Okay, thank you. And, and remember, so representative, the other piece is that cannabis is part of this process, right? It's just, it's, it's one of the other ingredients that is used in the process. Great. Wonderful, thank you. I just want to make sure we're not going down the road of creating something synthetic that is going to create huge problems like we've seen in other areas. Yeah, no, totally understand. Thank you for the question. Thank you. And Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Lynn. Hi. Um, there, there's something about this that just seems a little unsettling to me. Um, one, it sounds like we're trying to come up with a use for hemp that we hadn't intended before. And is there some sort of demand out there or or need that this is trying to meet? In other words, do we have a supply side issue that now all of a sudden we're turning to hemp for the Delta 9 for rather than just the straight up cannabis? Well, so, so look, um, it, is, it is less expensive to produce Delta 9 THC from hemp 
um, in, through this process than it is to, you know, indoors grow cannabis. It, it takes less resources. Um, it, it's something where you can rely on nature to water and for sun. And that's all to the positive. There, there's, no, it, there's no market for it now in Vermont because it's not legal and, and we can't, can't sell it now. But, but what, what, we're, what we're trying to do, um, Vermont CBD Labs, as the name suggests, is a CBD company, is a hemp company. And we, this industry has suffered mightily over the last two years. And I don't know how much all of you know about, you know, sort of the, the fortunes or misfortunes of the, of the hemp industry. But over the course of the last two years, we've seen a price collapse. We've seen farmers suffer because there's no market for their hemp. Processors have gone under and people are scrambling to try and find a market for, you know, this naturally grown important product. And, and this is one, forgive me, golden opportunity for Vermont farmers in the long term. So uh, Representative LeClaire, I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. But that's, that's the perspective of my client. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the other uses of Delta 9? Um, I, I've heard you talk about the, what, the hallucinogenic? Yeah, so it's, you know, like Delta, Delta, Delta 9 THC is that, is that part of, of cannabis that, has, that gets people, forgive me, high, right? Like that's, that's what it is. And so the, the, the THC, the um, oil, the distillate that's going to be made is something that would be used in, for example, you could use it in drinks or you could use it in food products or you could use it if, if you were vaping, you know, a, 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 like a jewel or something like that. Um, those are, you know, those are the kinds of things that cannabis processors were going to do anyway. This is just another way to fulfill that function. Very good. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Representative Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm curious if there's something going on with the market that I that I wasn't aware of um, that you might shed some light on. I, what I saw was lots of growers got into this thinking, here's the gold in the hills. And what happened was the markets got flooded and we, what we saw was a market correction. Supply and demand moved the prices. So was there something else that was happening there that, that I'm not aware of? Well, I, I think so, uh, I, although I don't know what you're aware of. But I, I would say this. It wasn't just an oversupply. At the same time, um, what we saw was the, the federal government was starting to cr crack down on any claims made by retailers around health benefits with CBD, and that depressed the market also. A lot of manufacturers which in, who, who intended to pick up CBD oil as part of their product declined to do it. And the market collapsed, and all of it, and, and many of these farmers who got into it were doing it with the assumption that um, these national manufacturers are actually going to go forward with their CBD-based products. They didn't, and so yeah, there was an oversupply. There remains an oversupply. Um, it, you know, as I'm as I understand it, you can buy CBD oil for much less than it takes to actually grow it and process it. And it's so bad that there is virtually no market for Vermont grown hemp, unless you are going to process it yourself and sell it yourself online. And, and look, I, I, I'm totally open to the concept that we, you know, maybe Vermont farmers need to live with the market. But what I'm suggesting to you is that, is that there is a market and what I'm talking about may create a, a fabulous market for Vermont farmers. Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you. Um, so I understand that hemp is used um, for the production of CBD. I, my understanding is that it's also a relatively environmentally low impact plant to grow that can be used in, in place of other fibers, cotton pa you know, used for paper making. And I'm wondering if there's any move to support our farmers to work in that arena as well. Because I don't want to take away from any way that we can lower our environmental impact. I, so look, I, I, I don't know uh, what, what individual farmers are doing. What I do know is that, is that there's this glut of, of dried hemp and it's just out there. 
and nobody is you know, nobody's doing anything with it. To the extent it's getting processed, then there's also a glut at the same time of CBD oil, isolate and distillate, and, and there's just no market for it. I mean, the market ha has collapsed for, for processed and unprocessed hemp. And so, you know, people may still be growing hemp, but, it, they, but they do it at their own peril, and it's on the, you know, sort of hope against hope that something changes. But I don't, you know, I, from what I hear from the client, and nothing appears to be changing. If anything, it, it's worsening, not getting better. Thanks. And Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, can you speak to the amount of Delta-9 that you would get, say, from a hemp plant versus what you would get from a straight-up cannabis plant? Do you have any idea how oh, those two correlate? You got, you got me there. I, that, that's, that's the, you stretched the limits of my technical knowledge. I apologize. Okay, thank you. And I can get an answer for you if you like. I mean, I, 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 I can get back to the client and get you that information. I'm not trying to brush you off. I don't want to provide false information. I actually would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I will. And Rhett McCarthy. Hi, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Lynn, I was just wondering, so I, I want to make it clear that your, your reading current law is prohibiting a manufacturer from buying hemp and then processing it. So if a licensed manufacturer under Act 164 bought hemp and, and then processed it into THC, you're reading our current regulation is not allowing that. So, so let me say it back to you a little bit differently because I wanna make sure that, and, and, and this is complicated and I'm not the best communicator around complicated ideas. So let me try again to make it super clear. Under the hemp statute, the, the hemp statutory scheme, if you're licensed, you can process dried hemp into CBD oil, not a problem. Under, this, under the cannabis statute, you can, you can process cannabis into Delta 9 THC. But under the cannabis statute, you cannot process uh, CBD oil into Delta 9 THC, which is what we want to do. It will be an ingredient with a cannabis product and processed together to create Delta 9 THC by altering the chemical composition of the CBD oil. And that's the one thing that you can't do under the cannabis statute because it says only the people with the, the CBD license, the, the hemp license can do that. But if you're under the hemp license, you can't create Delta 9 THC in excess of very low limits. That's the gap. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Yep, thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Lin, for being with us today and um, being patient with us and, and all of our questions. Um, we, uh, we appreciate you sharing your idea with us, and uh, we will certainly have some time to have committee discussion about this. So, Thank you so much for having me. It was great to see all of you. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, um, I think last on our list of witnesses this afternoon is Josh Decatur, who is the CEO of Trace Vermont. Uh, welcome, Josh, and uh, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts on S25. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Joshua Decatur. I'm co-founder of Trace. Uh, and um, I am a native Vermonter. I grew up in the islands. Um, I grew up farming and working at uh, Allen Home uh, Orchards. So Vermont agriculture is near and dear to my heart personally. Um, and I'm also a young entrepreneur in the state who understands you know, that the state has an aging population. A lot of my friends have not been able to stay in Vermont because of uh, economic uh, difficulties of being a young person here looking for for work and a career. Um, so you know, I I understand those predicaments on an individual level that people face, uh, and I I do think that the cannabis industry can be a wonderful opportunity to create uh, opportunities for local young uh, Vermonters uh, and and keep those people in the state. Uh, 
Um, I co-founded Trace a uh, little over three years ago um, with the goal of building compliant software, track and trace software for hemp and cannabis that was set up for a 50 state market. Uh, a lot of the early programs that were rolled out and I had experience interacting with them as a cultivator in Northern California for a season uh, were not set up for the success of the industry or for the protection of consumers, which uh, you know, we see as the main uh, goal of track and trace systems. We currently facilitate the track and trace system for the hemp program in Vermont through the agency of ag. Uh, where all hemp permit holders register. And uh, this season, they will actually track and trace their crop um, using our software. And that's a national first and something that uh, is protective to the hemp industry uh, here in the state, uh, hopefully uh, moving forward, um, given the difficulties of getting your product to market. So, you know, our company philosophy and our goals are really tied to uh, the industry as a whole. And we wanna see these industries be successful uh, here in the state. Um, so I'm here also as a member of the Vermont um, uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition. Uh, we joined the coalition as a industry participant. Um, we do uh, stand by uh, those other members of the committee and their testimony uh, of, of our group uh, and their testimony uh, and the policy that, that they've submitted. Um, and uh, what I'd like to address in, in my testimony today is a little bit of a high level view uh, to underscore the impacts of uh, the current statutes in Act 164, um, some of the potential difficulties that are hidden within uh, the, the way the market is being formulated right now from an economic perspective. Uh, I'm also a UVM graduate with an economics degree um, so, you know, I understand a little bit, thanks to my great uh, education at UVM, um, some of the market implications of having a few small businesses have price setting abilities uh, in, in an early stage market. Um, so a couple notes, um, like the uh, uh, Mr. Lin who testified before, I, uh, we, we also see, you know, hemp, businesses playing a big role uh, in uh, or having a role to play in a potential market in the cannabis industry that's coming up. And those businesses do have experience uh, track and tracing their products and with statewide track and trace systems. Um, and uh, I just wanted to add that to the record uh, because I, I do think there's uh, a, a little lack of awareness that these small farmers do have the, the sophistication and the, the abilities to meet statewide compliance for uh, controlled substances um, in, in a number of ways. That is actually something that the, in the medical program currently, there is no statewide system deployed. This is kind of left to each individual business. So in some ways, hemp farmers are even ahead of the game. Um, so you know, one of the key policy points that was talked about today uh, by members of our coalition were uh, licensing structures and licensing definitions that set production caps and also differentiate between uh, outdoor and indoor growing. And I, I really wanna underscore the importance of that in my testimony. Um, there needs to be a path to a sustainable business for these early craft license holders. And right now, because of how they lack definition and licenses and there, there lacks a definition from legislature about how exactly craft permit holders can get their product to market outside of the vertically integrated permits. Uh, you know, without that definition, there's, there's a huge risk that's, that's being introduced to the whole market right now uh, within the, the framework of, of Act 164. And that risk has to do with, with the cannabis economy being centralized around three uh, dispensaries that are going to have a head start in the program. So what, is, what does that risk look like? I mean, really it can be summed up as, as cartel-like behavior. You know, it's very easy for three vertically integrated dispensaries uh, to coordinate on price. It's very easy for them to, because they have access to retail margins while craft growers do not have access to those retail margins, uh, to be able to set prices in the wholesale market in a way where 
it's not viable for cannabis produce craft here cannabis producers to uh, see a return on their investment with their goods that, that they're producing. Um, this is a huge risk. It's something that we have seen play out in other states. Uh, we have a little bit more to go on now because you know Vermont has uh, has watched what's unfolded. You know I think wisely um, in in other states. So so we understand how things have gone wrong in, in states like Massachusetts, and a lot of it has to do with too much concentration uh, of, of those early permits and too much control at the retail level uh, to, to just a few uh, centralized permit holders. So, um, you know, really, I think there's a, there's a, a undercurrent here and, and I think there's a real opportunity and everyday Vermonters, small farmers, young people like myself um, who wanna be entrepreneurs in the state of Vermont in this market, I uh, really need uh, some one to stand up for them in the legislature. Uh, there uh, has not really been uh, any type of action yet in the, legis the legislation passed around uh, the emerging cannabis industry that clearly uh, you know, stands up and solves, actually solves issues for, these, for small businesses small Vermont businesses that want to join the industry. There's been minor things done like introducing the craft cultivation permits and the like, which are great starts. Um, and I wanna commend uh, the legislature, uh, the legislators that, that did, uh, were able to include those provisions in, in Act 164. But you, you can't just do a job halfway. It needs to be seen through and there has to be a path for market and licensing structures that make sense and enable uh, outdoor cultivation as, as a, a feasible uh, uh, business. And I also want to uh, thank Representative Gannon for expressing concern about energy use with the, the, la the last testimony we heard. That is a key important uh, piece of uh, uh, the, the licensing structure right now. Um, you know, it really does favor indoor cultivation, which as we know is you know, very environmentally intensive. Um, and, and we would like to see uh, the possibility for outdoor cultivation to supply a good amount of, of the product in Vermont. Um, and that's possible with the four to two to one license size ratios that were suggested uh, by, uh, um, uh, by our coalition. Um, uh, also, there's a key opportunity in here and we want to voice our support to use S25 as a way to start healing the impacts of the war on drugs and uh, the impacts of the early days of the cannabis industry, which we've seen unroll uh, in a way where only 4% of cannabis uh, businesses are currently owned uh, by BIPOC uh, business owners nationwide, which is you know, a, a sorry state of affairs. Um, so, uh, you know, it's rare, I think, to find an opportunity where legislation can bring together so many different groups of people from small organic farmers to young entrepreneurial Vermonters uh, to BIPOC communities in the state. Uh, and it's, it's really weighing the interest of a few permanent companies who have all, by the way, been able to make decent money over the past few years. There was an article recently that outlined how uh, the Vermont owned uh, uh, medical permit holder uh, has been able to uh, make $35 million of revenue since 2013. The two other permits in the state are going to be held by, um, uh, you know, publicly traded companies, um, which, you know, I think all of us would like uh, the primary participants, I would hope, in Vermont's local cannabis economy to be Vermonters. And we want to try to keep that money in state, I would hope. Um, so, uh, you know, in conclusion, um, I think it's uh, a wonderful opportunity that's before the legislature here today uh, with this bill to create a licensing structure that creates a clear path to market for craft licensees, which doesn't exist right now, uh, to address some other core issues that need to be cleaned up, uh, like being able to you know, bring hemp you know, into the, the cannabis supply chain, um, and also to adopt some of the language from H414 with respect to racial and social equity, which you know, right now, for a state like Vermont that tries to be so progressive,
expensive. We are sorely behind other states uh, with respect to their social equity programs um, that, are, that are built into legislation. So I, I think it's important that Vermont leads and doesn't follow on those issues. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Uh, we, we really have a, a, an eye towards trying to create an ecosystem and an economy that sets Vermont up for success uh, from a 50 state market perspective with a long-term view towards um, you know, bringing economic development and opportunity and justice and equity to the cannabis uh, market that's going to uh, you know, emerge and roll out in Vermont over the coming years. So thank you all for the time. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you for being with us. We have a question from Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Joshua. I recently uh, read an article uh, from Oregon. Seems like I've been involved with Oregon on a couple issues lately, but uh, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, and maybe you're aware of it. But uh, you know, you were just talked about bringing hemp into the supply chain as well. Uh, Mr. Lynn was talking about it, but. It seems to me that the article that I read in Oregon was um, there was such a um, oversupply of, of marijuana out there that uh, folks did go to growing hemp. And then what happened was because so, so many farmers were growing hemp again, the marijuana growers moved inside, uh, you know, again, to, to, to keep that cross pollination, I guess, or whatever it is happening. So isn't there a concern with that if, if uh, if the same sort of thing happens here, and it sounds like there could definitely be an issue if what Mr. Lynn says is that hemp is so much easier to grow, uh, there is a way to extract the THC. So just your thoughts on that, I guess. Yeah, um, so although that was a, you know, a side note, a, a few things there, um, I think uh, the production caps within the licensing structure that our coalition proposed go a long way towards addressing the oversupply issues, which were really at the heart of what happened in, in Oregon in their early days. They did not have the correct caps on size and canopy size in place, um, which you know caused oversupply and, and complicated to all these things. So I think it was much more their licensing structure than the hemp market that really created uh, that dynamic. Um, now with respect to you know hemp and cannabis uh, permit holders being able to do do business with each other. Uh, I think there are distinct use cases and distinct demand for different products. And, uh, you know, hemp has a much lower uh, total percentage of cannabinoids when compared to plants that will be grown for THC under, under cannabis permits. So it's not quite so, so cut and dry. Uh, I think it's really, uh, a question of, you know, do we want the ability for um, hemp licensee products to be able to find their way into the dispensary environment and to be available in dispensary retail outlets? Um, and I think there's um, every reason to create that, that opportunity in the state. And I think if you look at the constituencies, those who hold hemp permits now, those working in the, the hemp industry now, represent a lot of uh, diverse small Vermont businesses, the type of businesses that I think should uh, uh, be seen as the, the heart of the cannabis industry. Um, and I think there's a lot of crossover and a lot of them will end up holding both permits potentially. Uh, so. Thank, thank you, Joshua. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm interested in pursuing uh, one of the references to a fear you folks uh, have of the coalition, um, and it had to do with your uh, experience in economics classes uh, called cartelization. And notice you, you folks have been very good about instructing us how to make sure that there are plenty of small producers. By producers, I mean growers. The cropping seems to me the easy discussion for you folks and for me. However, as you well know, and you made reference to integrated licensees having an advantage uh, that single license holders wouldn't have. You linked it to that concept of cartels. Uh, my colleagues on the committee will uh, recall, I made a reference to the standard oil business model somewhat earlier in the day. 
what's your remedy to make sure at the other stages, not cropping, but the other stages are sufficiently atomistic, small, competitive to avoid cartelization? Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you, Representative uh, Anthony. Um, I think the, uh, well, a great starting point would be just having the legislature defined tiers uh, for craft permit holders at every level of the supply chain, from retail to delivery to processing to distribution, back up to cultivation. You know, that's, that's a great start because right now the only path to market is through a vertically integrated permit. And from what I can see, there's no economic incentive for a vertically integrated permit holder to uh, sell product that they have a, make a smaller margin on. So if these are you know, rational economic agents, uh, then it's very difficult to see how craft growers right now can find a way to put the choice in the hands of the consumers rather than uh, put, uh, you know, be controlled by uh, those few entities that have access to consumers. So I think that is a great starting point. Now within the, the specifics of you know, the size and scale limitations for the other permits like processing, uh, distribution, delivery, retail. Um, I think there's more specific language on that that was submitted by our coalition that I will uh, yield to. Uh, but I think just simply defining it and creating that uh, opportunity on par with the vertically integrated permits will go a long way and will at least put the power in the hands of the people and the consumers rather than in the hands of the, the largest industry participants. And I think that's very important. And the way that these small businesses can compete is by being more in touch with consumer demands, by having higher quality products, uh, which is something that Vermont farmers do with everything they do. Uh, and so I'm confident they'll do that. And if they're able to, which right now they cannot, uh, I do think there will be elements of the, the free market that play out uh, where we are able to have uh, viable, small cannabis businesses that are locally owned uh, make up the bulk of the, the Vermont cannabis market. Okay, thank you. I just, uh, you've used the phrase, uh, our small growers need a path to market. And you also made reference to your hope that uh, other uh, license holders in the supply chain would also have uh, access to market. What are you envisioning? Because as I recall, there already are bars to uh, the number of licenses that a single uh, legal entity can uh, possess. And I believe there's also a prohibition about people other than the integrated producers. And you're right, they have that advantage. But there's a prohibition about, uh, say, a distributor owning other classes of licenses. So what's the remedy there? Because notice, be careful of what you wish for. If a distributor can own various classes of licenses, created another route to cartelization. Correct. And, and I don't think that uh, we're advocating for uh, large companies to be able to buy up five different permits in parallel to the vertically integrated licenses. So really, uh, it's size, size is, the, is the end of the game. OK, I understand. Exactly. Thank you. Production caps are key. And um, also, I think there's a big difference when a business is specialized and focused. Like when we came out of alcohol prohibition, right, there, were the, there was a three-tier system developed uh, to prevent uh, vertical integration because it was recognized back then that that was a, a potential problem uh, and something that would hurt the economy and businesses on the whole. So. Similarly to that, I think it's, it's quite different when there is a price incentive for businesses to sell product produced in-house versus when you have a specialized business focused solely on distribution or focused solely on processing or solely on retail that is, are looking for other businesses to purchase from or to collaborate with to bring product to market. So that's another key differentiator. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um... Mr. Decatur for being with us today. Any other questions from committee members? All right. 
we appreciate your time this afternoon um, and uh, committee members, uh, that is a wrap for today. We, um, uh, we've got a couple more witnesses tomorrow morning and then we will have ample time for committee discussion and, um, and getting back into the bill language that, um, that we hope to move out. So uh, if committee members want to, um, you know, send send any thoughts or impressions, uh, must haves, can't haves, um, you know, any feedback that you'd like to send, please send them to the vice chair and myself, and we will discuss them tomorrow in committee. Have a wonderful afternoon.